when we uh, put together our plan for the National Reentry Resource Center with all our partners, we talked about two key values uh, that we had. One was to really make sure that we um, incorporated the voice and the perspective of people who have been incarcerated and had that experience and to really inform the work of the Resource Center. And I think you saw evidence of that uh, in the last session, which was particularly moving. The other value that we have that's very important to us is to never lose sight of the people who are victimized when a crime occurs. To always remember that when a crime happens, there are also victims and family members who suffer losses. And um, we were very fortunate when putting together our uh, proposal to uh, work closely with Suzanne Brown McBride, who at the time was the executive director of the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault. And she was going to be a, a key partner of ours. And then we did actually one better, where Suzanne actually joined the uh, Council of State Governments as our deputy director for the Justice Center. It was a real coup for us, and I know everyone in California was really disappointed to lose her. She was the chair of the uh, Sex Offender Management Board, and before that uh, was the director of the uh, Washington State Coalition Against Sexual Assault. And everybody knows her nationally for her tremendous advocacy on victims and just received an incredibly prestigious award uh, from Congress as, uh, as, one, as the nation's most honored crime victim advocate. So um, we're thrilled to have her aboard. She's going to talk a little bit to you um, now about the key role of victims uh, as we think about reentry. So Suzanne? Hey everybody, how you doing? Yeah, I, I have been um, so impressed by how much energy and enthusiasm you have. I think of this as my second second chance conference because I was one of the four folks who actually did make it <laughs> here in February um, because the conference, the conference got canceled as I was coming across the country. So but when I landed at O'Hare in Chicago, I got the call that the conference was um, canceled but you couldn't talk to United about going back home to California, and so I actually did make it all the way here to DC, and y'all weren't here. Uh, uh, no, y'all weren't. <laughs> but um, thank you for just a couple minutes to talk about something that's really important to me. Uh, in 1991, I, um, there was a young woman who showed up in a hospital in a suburb of Portland, Oregon. She had been shopping for Christmas presents at a mall um, in Clackamas, uh, the Clackamas Town Center Mall, for those of you from Oregon. And that night, as she was coming out with her Christmas presents for her two young boys, she went into the crowded parking lot of that mall. And from there, an individual put a knife to her back, dragged her to her car, and raped her. That night at 1 o'clock in the morning was my first call as a crisis worker in Portland, Oregon. And I spent the next six or seven hours in a hospital room with a young woman who had an enormous amount of questions. She wanted to know, first and foremost, was she going to be okay? She was horrified that she might be pregnant. She was terrified she might have AIDS. She didn't know how she was going to talk to her family. And she didn't know how she was going to talk to the police. That night, I learned a lot about systems. I learned about a system that was fractured, that didn't know what to do for someone who was coming in for that kind of exam, doctors who were overwhelmed, nurses who didn't know what to do, and law enforcement officers who didn't know the right questions. And at that time, I also learned a lot about what it meant to think about how not only crime impacts individuals, but impacts people throughout systems. And it was that night that also sort of then began to inform the subsequent conversations that I had with victims of crime after that event. After that night, I started talking to the various rape victims that I talked to on the phone through crisis lines, the folks that I met day to day, and I started hearing some of the same things. Because what I started hearing was, what's going to happen to him? What's going to happen once you know, he or she gets caught? Am I going to be safe? What's going to be going on? How is this going to be? You know, what are we going to do as a community? And the answers at the time were not terribly good. 20 years ago, we didn't have a whole lot of an idea about what that was going to look like. But what complicated those questions was the fact that the folks that were asking those questions were daughters, brothers, sisters, nephews, coworkers, church members, people who had connections to those individuals who committed crime, 
who were asking for accountability, but were also very aware of the connections that they had about the individuals who had adversely and sometimes horribly impacted their lives. And so when those folks began to ask those questions, the thing that they said most profoundly and most importantly was, how do I know this is not going to happen again? And for me, that became a lot of the reason why an improbable career as an advocate for victims of crime became one that also became an advocate who was committed to issues of reentry. It became important to me to think about how it was that not only were we working to solve the hurt and the harm of the moment, but we were thinking systemically about providing for the success of those individuals who are inside of systems. 20 years ago, there was a huge binary between victims and offenders. Those of us who did victim services didn't ever talk about offenders, except to say, how are they going to be held accountable? What are we going to do to identify them? Money spent on offenders was kept always separate from money spent on victims. We saw these things as completely distinct and honestly didn't think about them very much. Similarly, the criminal justice system had very much of a notion that um, you know, what we really spent a lot of our time on was the front end, investigation, adjudication, and all of those issues. And we didn't think a lot about what happened when people came out of incarceration. And so subsequently, release from prison was a lonely affair. It was lonely for offenders who oftentimes didn't have the support and the services that they desperately needed in order to come back to the community. And it was oftentimes lonely and terrifying for victims who didn't know when they were coming out, didn't know if their safety was going to be honored, didn't know who they could turn to, and didn't know what resources were out there for them as well. And so in listening to those victims and survivors, and listening to those questions, and thinking about that issue of never again, is how then I became sort of, in a, I think, a very natural progression of starting to work on issues around offender entry and around offender management. In Washington State, I had the enormous privilege of working with a Catholic conference on talking about sex offender housing. And in many ways, people thought we were the ultimate odd couple, that you know, a feminist anti-rape organization was standing with a Catholic conference on trying to identify housing for high-risk sex offenders. And for, year, for two or three years, we met at the highest levels of state government in Washington. And at the time, there was a newspaper story written about me that said, Suzanne Brown, unlikely ally to sex predators. I disagree with that because I don't think I'm an unlikely ally to public safety. I don't think I'm an unlikely ally to trying to make sure that communities are safe, that victims are held precious, and that offenders are successful. And I think in that sense, we have the opportunity with the Second Chance Act to really start promoting those types of messages. It seemed equally natural to me that a victim advocacy organization in the state of California would not only author le legislation to have a sex offender management board, would not only sponsor that legislation through two terms and one veto, but would insist upon having a victim advocate as their chair because we recognize that the partnerships between the victim's community, between victims themselves, and what we can do with offenders is a profound opportunity. And I think you, in my mind, are one of the most profound manifestations of that opportunity. We have the opportunity with the Second Chance Act to do a variety of things together between victims' organizations and those who are working on making sure that offenders have a successful way home. That victims who are depending upon us to think about issues like safety and information have the opportunity to also know that the people they were asking me about have also a chance to succeed. Over 20 years, I've had the opportunity to work with many of you and many of your analogs in the states that I've worked in. I've worked with parole and probation, you know, corrections folks of all stripes, law enforcement prosecutors, people who work in housing and all sorts of things. And I am so profoundly grateful because I know that as I stand as an advocate for community safety, as do you, that as I stand for the success of offenders returning to the community, that you stand with me for the success of victims who are trying to survive and thrive in the aftermath of violence. And so I want to thank you. I want to thank you for caring enough about victims to do this right. That you are thinking about evidence-based practices, that you are thinking about not just doing what sounds good, but will actually make a difference in your community. I want to thank you for being invested enough in your communities to demonstrate that what you're doing works by collecting data and by being able to tell a story to the stakeholders of your community who want to know that we're doing the right thing. And I want to thank you for having the pride in your profession and in your work to conceptualize doing things differently than we've done them before. 
I am so profoundly happy that in most jurisdictions around the United States, the rape exam that I sat through 20 years ago with that client does not look like the rape exams that happen today. I think similarly, we should all be very proud that the way that we talk about offenders coming home is not the way that we were talking about doing it 20 years ago. As a victim advocate, I also depend on you. I depend on you to make me and the victims I represent a part of your work. I depend on you to make a place at the table in a meaningful and collaborative way so that we can talk about our shared goals and priorities. I depend on you to remember that real lives are at stake here, both in the moment of someone's thought about safety and safety planning, or overarchingly about somebody who may be very profoundly fearful about somebody returning home and can have that fear assuaged, or maybe connected to services that can make the difference in their lives. I also want to partner with you. I want to partner with you to help make communities responsive to both offenders coming home and to victims, because this is the community. That binary of victims and offenders does not do justice to the fact that we have complicated relationships. We live together in our communities, and we are all adversely impacted when our communities are adversely impacted. I also want to partner with you to make sure that when we are doing this holistically, when we are collaborating, that I stand next to you to talk to policymakers, to talk to the media, to talk to the world about how exciting the work you're doing is. It may have seemed unlikely to work on sex offender housing. It may have seemed unlikely to do the Sex Offender Management Board. And some even thought it was unlikely that I came to the Justice Center um, the, after having sort of a, a lifelong career as a victim advocate. But it seems to me to be quite natural. For the same reasons you're here, I'm here. For the same reasons that you know, we want this to succeed in communities, I want this to succeed in communities. I mean, ultimately, I believe in second chances. I believe that offenders want to rejoin the community and that we can do that and help them to do that with success, with dignity, and with assistance. I also, though, believe that victims also want to seek safety and want to have the conditions to thrive, and that these are not mutually exclusive, and that the second chance isn't just the second chance for offenders coming home, but I think it's a second chance for everyone, including our communities, including victims. And so I thank you for your work tonight. I thank you for your time. There's fantastic dessert up here, and I hope that you take advantage of it. And I really, really encourage you to you know, keep thinking about how it is that you do this work and how we can partner together. Me, my analogs, the folks that we're working with in the victims community throughout this project. Um, I commend all of you for the efforts and the work that you're doing, and I hope that you have a really great evening. Thank you for your time. Yeah.